Bartlebyan pictures. The following podcast contains spoilers for The Shape of Water. You have been warned. Ah, yeah. Ooh. I missed it. Get oh, it. Get it. Nice. Yours didn't nice. make any sound, Kenny. There we are. No, mine is not so noisy today. My, my Guayaki organic brand yerba mate is in a bottle instead of a can. So. Oh, they quarter. do that? They do bottles. They do cans. They do all kinds of stuff, my friend. Wow. But the main thing they do is give me fine energy fine focusing power yes you know Organic what they do to me power they come they make me come to life so <laughs> they do that was the weirdest they sentence. make you what come to life okay yeah. let's, uh, now let's we we here. get we end up talking way too much about our sponsor in every episode according to the feedback from our listeners <laughs> so i'll just get straight to the point the talkies is sponsored by guayaki brand yerba mate thank you go try their delicious products I've got uh, mint flavor today, and man, oh, that is good. Good stuff. Gives us the power we need to watch movies. <laughs> <laughs> you know what they say? Uh, oh, oh wow! Whoa. Wow, Kenny! Jeez. Sorry, sorry about that's that. That's what we're doing today. It still, it still looks all right. There. We're all right. Yeah, we're looking good. Okay, um, don't kick the cameras. You know what they say? Yerba mate uh, by Guayaki. Uh, pays the bills here at Carmen Line Studios. <laughs> they pay us lots and lots of money to plug their product at the beginning of each episode. So you have to withstand that. You know, but, you know, it's just what we do to make our living. Oh, you made me choke so, a little. Thanks, Guayaki. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Thank you, Guayaki, Guayaki, for your continued support. Now, on to the show. Today is a special, special day. Because since uh, Blade Runner... Mm. We have not covered a movie on this show that we all liked. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So today we get the rare privilege of talking about a movie that we all loved. That we enjoy. Yeah, yes, that's very weird. Much enjoy. We actually the like a movie. Shape of Water. Yes. Yeah. By the great Guillermo del Toro. Yes. Um, we'll just start us off here in case you haven't heard of The Shape of Water. We are about to spoil it for you, so you should probably go see it. Yep. But uh, the synopsis is, at a top-secret research facility in the 1960s, a lonely janitor forms a unique relationship with an amphibious creature being held in captivity. Uh, directed, as I said, by Guillermo. Screenplay, also by Guillermo del Toro, with the help of Vanessa Taylor. I saw an interview just recently where he talked about bringing her aboard to help him finish the script. And he said, uh, most people have assumed that she came on to do the more warm, feely, relationshipy, lovey-dovey stuff, mm. the, the, the softer part of the story. And he said that actually isn't true. That that's all from him. <laughs> she brought all like the Cold War storyline. Oh, which nice. Is, yeah, which nice. is interesting. Huh. It's really good. Um. Uh, and starring had a fantastic cast. Yeah, a really yeah, good did. cast. Um, Alisa Esposito in the main role as... No, no, sorry. <laughs> that was my, Sally Hawkins in the main role as Alisa. Ah, yeah. Uh, actually, they call her Eliza in the movie, but it's spelt with an S. I've never seen Eliza spelt that way. Eliza. It's, I guess it's Eliza. Was she in anything else noteworthy? Cause I, don't, I was not familiar with her Sally at all. Hawkins? Sally Hawkins... She was great. In because I have yeah. an endless depth of film knowledge in my head, I could tell you right now, <laughs> she's in the sequel to Paddington Bear. Oh. Oh. Coming out this year. Oh, coming out. <laughs> uh, she was in the original Paddington Bear. Oh, okay. You Good pulled, for her. You pulled that from your memory. Yep. I just know these things. <laughs> from future. She was in Godzilla oh, okay. in 2014 with huh. Brian Cranston. I remember that movie. Brian Cranston was in that movie? Yeah. yeah. He I was awesome. See, I haven't seen that one. Oh, never mind. I won't say anything then. That's not spoiling. You spoil Godzilla. Movie. Yeah, <laughs> I was about to spoil it for you. Uh, she's been in lots of movies for a long time. So yes. Well, this is. I'm not going to go over all this, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Pro- acting professionally since 1996. This is the first uh, film I've seen with her in it, and she was fantastic in it. She was fantastic. She was really good. Very, very good. Uh, Michael Shannon, uh, yes. someone I wasn't terribly familiar with either, plays uh, Richard Strickland, the security guard. Well, not security guard. He's like, he's a, I'm not exactly sure what his title is. He's a government security agent. 
Is he he was working for the FBI, right? FBI or Homeland Security? Yeah. I don't know. So CIA. Government. Which one was he? He's he's the, the dude, the, the 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 main villain. Oh yeah, that's what I thought. Yes. Yeah. He Great plays uh, General Zod in Man of Steel. That's right. Yeah. Now I know that face. He's a good baddie. He, yes, he is, is a good baddie. He has a yeah. good. He has a good baddie face. Yes, he does. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, let's see. Richard Jenkins as Giles. Oh, that's the neighbor. Oh, okay. He was fantastic too. I loved his character. He's the artist next door. Yeah. Uh, and another outsider that was good friends with our main character. And then uh, I'll, I'll just round off our cast here with a couple more. Octavia Spencer, of course, is the uh, other janitor. Uh, her character is Zelda. 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 Zelda? Yeah, Zelda. her name's Zelda Fuller. Yeah. Legend of. <laughs> uh, it's funny how many movies you get through and you never realize what lots of, a lot of characters' names, names are. Names, yeah. <laughs> I'm always really bad with that. Doug Jones played the amphibian man. Which is really interesting because it uh, it was very clear that to anyone familiar with Del Toro movies that the amphibious creature in this movie looked a lot like the amphibious character in Hellboy. Abe, <laughs> yeah, played by the same guy, really, Doug Jones. Wow, who That's also hilarious. played the Pan. Oh, really? Pan's okay. Labyrinth, which I haven't cool. seen. Yeah, which you must see, by the yeah, way. Which I must see. Excellent movie. Yeah. All right, so let's. Let's go ahead and move beyond the cast for now. Um, well, I guess the other notable one is the double agent. Um, oh, yeah. He the was... Russian double agent is the guy from uh, A Serious Man. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I oh, like he him. was good in that. Yeah, he, I like him a lot. Uh, let me find him. Where are <laughs> he's, you? He's good at doing the... <laughs> this at guy? being a serious man. <laughs> serious and concerned looking face. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he, his story was kind of sad, but... Um, Really well performed. Super well, well performed. Really well done. Yeah. I Octavius? feel bad now because the Wait, uh, is that her name? The o- Zelda? Octavia Spencer. Yeah. Yeah. Octa- Wait, Oct- Octavia. Yeah, Octavia. That's a she did a crazy great name. as well. Yeah. I mean, it was just a strong, strong She's good performance all around happened. the whole movie. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's start to. Oh well, I guess let's just mention the last these last two. DP is a guy named Dan Lawson. Um, uh, who I really haven't seen any other of his work. Has he? Has he shot anything notable? Uh, yeah, he has. Uh, he did the last Guillermo del Toro movie, um, Crimson Pacific Crimson Rim. Peak. <laughs> not the yeah, not Pacific Rim, Crimson <laughs> Peak, and then a bunch of stuff I hadn't heard of. But he's worked in Hollywood for a long, long time. Huh. Uh, but I really liked. I we'll get into the visuals later, but I thought he did fantastic. Yeah. Um, it's hard to tell where the DP, where the DP begins and the art director ends. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Especially in a movie like this, where the art direction is clearly such a huge part of the visuals. And then finally, the music, uh, Alexandre Desplat, who made a wonderful sort of like French cinema feeling score. Very much. Which uh, stayed pretty minimalistic the whole time, but was just so beautiful. That was great. And he did the music for Argo. Oh, nice. Um, uh, King's Speech, a lot of stuff just hey, recently. two best picture winners. But not best soundtrack winners. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. He scored, and, and this movie's likely to be nominated for best picture, I'm sure. That pretty much guarantees so, a win. If you want a best picture, you need this guy <laughs> to, to do your music. You want this guy to do your music. <laughs> He's like, you don't, it's, it's not about Hans Zimmer, man. Um, you want Alexandre. All right, let's dig in. Yeah. Let's talk about, let's start off with the, the story, and uh, we'll, Taylor, kick us off. Um, well, the story is fantastic. It's like, I like it because it's, um, it doesn't really feel very cliched. Like it has a lot of different, um, elements to it. Obviously a romance with a, another species, <laughs> borderline, I guess that is, uh, bestiality, <laughs> but you know, done, done in a way that, 
<laughs> What's so good about it is they shape of water. Bestiality <laughs> done tastefully. Oh, tell us, Taylor, what is so good about bestiality? <laughs> so, well, it's how they set you up for it. They they established um, kind of a a sexual undertone through the, the beginning, first, like the, yeah, first the first scene, scene opening yeah. scene, and yeah. it, they establish it as a part of her daily routine. That's true. Um, so it, it gets it gets in your head. You that, know right away yeah. that this is something that's missing in a uh, missing piece in her life. Yeah, right. exactly. Yeah, right. So that way, when it happens, it's not so shocking to where it's like stupid. Yeah, but you can totally buy into it. You can, t- yeah. Um, now, if if we're gonna have the the bestiality discussion now, <laughs> <laughs> I I was in the theater. I did a matinee, which is always dangerous because typically the people who go to matinees don't like care about the movie. early in the day <laughs> matinees are people who don't care about movies, and you get uh, you tend to get a lot of the older crowd, yeah, who just see every movie no matter what. <laughs> and there was this older couple behind me who just could not handle the uh, the the interspecies love. And this guy is just laughing hysterically every time they connected, oh. uh, the, which bugged me. But, um, uh, but two two thoughts. One, in an interview, Guillermo del Toro said, "This isn't interspecies. Mm. It's it's uh, she's not connecting with an animal. She's connecting with a divine. Oh, interesting. That that this this is a divinity. Uh, camera, restart." Oh. And that he sees it as a, uh, a a love affair with a higher form, whereas when people talk about animal, you know, like bestiality, it'd be like with a lower form. <laughs> gotcha. you know? I, She's obviously not dominating right. this, but this is a creature with a far beyond kind of power. It's funny because you don't you don't really hear or really learn about him as a god until the end of the movie. Mm. Right about him having a divine presence. Well, there's a little bit. Of, it's like hinted in like they hinted, one line. They, they, they mentioned but that it's like later the local in the film. natives worshipped him. Right. Yeah. Well, well, they say yeah. that, and then they they say, or they they have him inside a prison for most of the time, and they like torture him and cut him, and mm. he can bleed, and it, it's very much he's an animal. Yeah. You know, they treat him as an animal. So right. It, I could see. <laughs> so even even um, this fish man. <laughs> I don't know. Does he have a name exactly? Abe. His name's Abe. Abe. No. <laughs> <laughs> he uh, he has this character arc that's revealed rather than like developed by interacting with him because you you learn about him through other characters learning about him as yes. well. Yes. Yes. So he his character arc is revealed. Sorry. My bad. Um. Whereas Elisa, her her storyline. Uh, has some of the best character development I've seen in a movie in a long time. Yeah, it was so. Sorry. All right, it was Dropping so. Re- all over sound effects, <laughs> zing, boom, pop. <laughs> uh, it was so refreshing to have a movie where the first 15, 20 minutes of the movie was solely dedicated to developing the lead character's mm. character. Yeah, like scenes that just played one after the next to just. Get used to her life and her her background and her frame of mind and the way she thinks, and I really feel like most movies like jump to the plot point really quick, and this one didn't. It gave you a good good twenty minutes of development with her, yeah, mm-hmm. and I found that very refreshing. That was extremely. You, your turn on story. Oh, um, I mean, I I loved it through and through. Like you were saying, the uh, the character development in here was just amazing just astonishingly amazing um they they do such a good job of uh of keeping the theme of the movie kind of tied into the characters themselves and the motives behind you know what they're trying to do so like we we uh you talked about this prior but there was um the bad guy had like a motivation to do what he was doing and you could see him you could see yourself in the bad guy you know, yeah, you could you could understand why he would do something like that, and that right. anyone could do something like that. Yes, well, the, I mean the villain um, comes across as c- quite evil. Yeah, right. Yeah, uh, but he got there to that point probably by always making the right decisions 
based on the context of his life and his job and what he does. Mm-hmm. Right. So right? Same, yeah. he didn't get there by being, being evil. evil. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> right. 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 People and but in, but like in the end, he becomes the person doing the evil thing. Yeah. I think those are the coolest probably villains are the ones that have uh, motivating factors that aren't just to oppose. Now, yeah, there's there's uh, some of the best villains I think do have just opposing um, sensationalism about them being like, like the Joker is one of them, you know, where he only does things because Batman is doing things, Yeah, you know, but when you have uh, a natural bad guy who's just living their life and it just so happens that their life clashes with the hero, like that's, that's great. That's great story right there. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. Um, Now, this movie did what, um, something that I think the three of us are really like doing and are aspiring to do more in some of our future projects which is in a very seamless way uh, weave very ab- abstract scenes <coughs> into a narrative movie oh, yeah. that is grounded in a real universe and then these abstract scenes that are, that are not necessarily imagination or dream or allegory or real, they don't really say, yeah. but the, you know, they just happen. For example, the very first scene of the movie you fly in, you, you swim into <laughs> the flooded apartment from the ocean. Like yeah. you're in the ocean, you go through a crack in a rock into her flooded apartment where she's floating, you know? This this isn't a reveal yeah. about, you know, it, it's not part of the story. It's not necessarily foreshadowing. I mean, it really right. is kind of like a, like a tone poem sort of thing mm-hmm. where it's like... It's, uh, it, it sets a tone and huh. allows you to look for meaning. For for me to, to really connect with the story, I feel like every shot has to have intent or every scene or everything like that has an intent and there's nothing that exists on accident. Um, but what you're saying does exist on purpose and I believe it is yeah. to communicate, like you said, a tone yeah. or, or an emotion of some sort. It is to put us in a certain mindset and like you were talking about with the sexual undertones, you know, they never tell you straight up she needs a boyfriend. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You never tell you straight up that, you know, that she's looking for this guy as a sexual partner. But you kind of get everything just through the emotion, through the feel of the film. And I yeah. really, really enjoy that. Um, that's pretty much, like, my favorite thing about films. Like, what you were saying, Kenny, is the more, like, it, it like, those scenes of, like, where it goes all black and white and she has, she starts talking and has, like, a, a musical right. number that was really cool. or even the very end of the film where she sprouts gills from her yeah. from her scars they yes. don't exist like they don't tell you where it exists in context to the world right right it's not like a dream did she it's, literally sprout gills and yeah. live or is this an analogy for that she died happy because she found love yes you know, right before death right and um to me that it doesn't matter <coughs> because it's supposed to it's just the visual you have to look at it and you yeah. see this happening and that's like the conclusive thought to the whole film or whatever so in the dance number yeah I, and i loved that scene and so it it felt like you know the main character is mute she cannot speak and then all of a sudden she starts it's like you see the ability of speaking starting to come out of her and she's trying to say the words the lyrics of a of a love song and then all of a sudden the lights go down and she's just illuminated, and she turns. It turns black and white, and then her speaking turns to singing, and she stands up, and she's on a dance, uh, a, a sound stage, set up for a big 1950s style Hollywood dance number, with the Aquaman, <laughs> yeah. right? And they do a song and dance number together, yeah. and they're not trying to convince you that, you know, obviously that this really happened. Nor that uh, the Aquaman just planted a, a happy uh, yeah you know, in vision head. in her yeah. brain or anything like that. There's right. no need for explanation. Yeah. Right. Yes. And movies that try so hard to make everything to to fill in every gap and make every <laughs> question answered tend to just drive me crazy. Yeah. Um. So so I love that. Yeah. But not everyone can handle it. Yes. Two people walked out. Of the theater <laughs> in that scene. Wow, <laughs> that was it's that's it's a, so puzzling to me because because to me that's like the most interpretive. I mean, I, I guess 
on a surface level, when you look at something like that, when you see a scene of them suddenly dancing and she can sing, and it's super cheesy. I mean, like on the surface level. Mm-hmm. But when seeing I, the man in the fish suit dancing, right, tap dancing, yeah, yeah. right, right, exactly. Yeah, I mean, super cheesy. But if you're not, I mean, if you're not into the film and understanding what the film is about and everything, if you're not flowing with it, then yeah, I, I could, I could see that again at a surface level. Yeah, but you can do that with any film. I mean, I don't know. I was surprised at how much I bought in to their romance. Oh yeah, that I actually bought why these two would love each other. Yeah. And I I think the reason why it worked, uh, I mean, like it's hard to really, I mean, if you're honest, it's really hard to put yourself in the in the shoes of Belle from Beauty and the Beast. <laughs> right? Right. <laughs> that's my thumbnail <laughs> right there. Oh, and that's your thumbnail. <laughs> blowing your nose. All right, so I just said uh, in the shoes, shoes of, of Belle. Belle from Beauty and the Beast. Um, I mean, it, it's it's obviously a much less complex sort of storytelling. It doesn't really ask you to, but if you did, I'd, I don't really understand why Belle would romantically fall in love with right. this beast, right? Mm-hmm. Um, because that is a huge gap to bridge mm-hmm. the, you know a, a, a different creature and a human uh, but in this case you had two beings that immediately identified with each other because there's no one else like them in the world mm-hmm. and so with her her thing is that she cannot speak right and he cannot speak yep and people <clears throat> see her as um, being in- incomplete, broken, different, right? And people see it as being incomplete, different, and you know, alien, right? And uh, and so, you know, because of the, um, I guess, their deficiencies, their perceived deficiencies, when they came together, like the sparks just made perfect sense. Like it, it took two scenes. Two really simple scenes, montages even, <laughs> yeah. that made you buy in that yeah. they were genuinely in love. To, to me, I so I guess if I had any qualm about it, it, it would be that the romance did feel uh, not completely motivated to me. And, and by I mean not completely, I mean like not... In ninety eight percent, it was at ninety eight percent instead of a hundred percent. Is what I mean. Like, very very slight. Yeah, like I understood exactly what was happening. I understood the deficiencies. It did happen the fast. Thing. It yeah. did happen it was, a little fast. It was a little fast. And I think it's because the uh, the sea monster um, doesn't have an empathetic thread, you know, because you you under, I mean you understand that he's a captive, and you understand that he is trying to communicate, but there's no. He he's very much treated like a like an animal, and he, he's treated like something that's captured and needs to be freed, but not necessarily needing to be loved. You know, she oh, really right. needs to be loved. He doesn't completely, yeah. but he does. Again, this is why ninety eight percent instead of a hundred. Yeah, that's interesting. So. Um, if I don't, if I can go on a a mini tangent real you, quick, you have the floor. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I saw the greatest showman. Um, yesterday, yeah, and so th- I guess it's a spoiler for that, but I think it's fine. No. So no. Zac Efron is We're in this movie. It. <laughs> it's okay. okay. Zac Efron and um, it's Efron. <laughs> Zac Efron. Yeah. The, <laughs> Sorry, my the accents on the O. Zac Efron. Thank you. And and uh, I think her name was Z- Zendaya. and she she plays Mary Jane in, or MJ in Spider Man. I see. They have this romance. <laughs> they have this romance in the film, and it is never, ever, ever, ever explained why they love each other. This is how it happens. Zendaya's doing her her uh, trapeze artist stuff, and and she's swinging up, and they look at each other, and they see each other. Their That's, eyes meet. Yeah, their they're, eyes meet. That's in love. it. And then she's like love leaving. Love sight, man. She's like leaving her boyfriend for him. 
because they looked at each other. You can't empathize with that? Yeah. I, You've never looked at someone and be like, that's it. <laughs> it's when all I've, over. We're swinging yeah. on trapeze. I've done that. Yeah. Who hasn't? My wife and I still have never spoke to each other. <laughs> we, we met about 20 years ago. We looked at each other. We knew it was meant to be. That was it. <laughs> it's, so, it's so funny how simple simple characteristics yeah right just just understanding exactly how or why these two people came together yeah and that's all you need yeah no um yeah and yeah so. you were able to buy into the romance of eliza <laughs> and the a, fish a, man. a new yeah. girl and the fish man like right? yeah. a million times more right that's so yeah, yeah that's yeah. great that's good storytelling that's, right yes, there it is. great yes, i it is. applaud you guillermo um indeed guillermo's last film Crimson Peak, which yeah. I haven't seen. Um, I was disappointed in. I was too. I thought it was a little <clears throat> underwhelming. Yeah. So I'm I'm glad that and something about this film has brought him. Funny enough, the thing lacking up. seemed to be the story. Yeah. In that one, yeah. which he seems to be very good at. Yeah. Um, I don't know what happened with that movie. I feel like this was the return to form for Guillermo del Toro from Pan's Labyrinth. Absolutely. Um, which is how I discovered him was because of Pan's Labyrinth. I've seen some of his short films, um, Spanish language, mm. that are amazing. They're yeah. equally good. Um, but I feel like when he made Hellboy, which is good, yeah. Uh, but it was sort of a hybrid of his style <coughs> with the comic book genre. Mm. <coughs> and I feel like he kind of got went off following the comic book side of that experience. After that, yeah. and now he's come. He's come back, and this is like just right in the vein of. And, and, I, and sometimes I wish more filmmakers were were more like uh, the Coen Brothers. The Coen Brothers are practically a brand. Yeah, like they make Coen Brother movies, right? And I always know what to expect. It's I'm always surprised in certain ways, but it's always within the boundaries of what a Coen Brothers movie is. Yeah, and I love it. And I think if if Guillermo del Toro it was just like I'm going to make these, <laughs> you know, less than twenty million dollar budget, sort of uh, fantasy tragedies. Yeah, you know these dark fantasies. Yeah, like Man, monsters. I'd watch those well, all day. I mean, yeah. that's why people hated M Night Shyamalan, right? Because he was too much of a brand. Because no, because he was a brand that oh, he was that always, deviated yeah. all the time. Yeah, he was constantly subverting. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Um. My first inter uh, not interaction, uh, first time that I've uh, I don't know what you call it danced with <laughs> danced with Guillermo del Toro. Um, the the first time I saw his work was must have been nice. It was well, Hellboy was my first one. Are you uh, talking about dancing? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hellboy was was the first one, but I didn't I didn't realize it was him that uh, had made it. Um, it was a uh, PT. Oh yeah. yeah, which was uh, PT. Yeah, it's it was a trailer, playable trailer is what PT stands for. Yeah. Oh, that he directed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for a video game. He um he collaborated with uh, Hideo Kojima, who is a very prolific video game developer. He's like probably one of the first auteur video game makers. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, so he collaborated Guillermo with with uh, Kojima on making this horror game. So they released this little playable trailer that is absolutely terrifying. And yeah, yeah and, and it's, it's become really imaginative. It's become super famous because of just how imaginative it is. And cool. looking into it, I can understand Gil- Guillermo's uh influence. Yeah. Because there's there's weird things in there. There's uh there's like a, a radio narration coming from a dead fetus inside of a sink. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So. Yeah, which is like definitely kind of a gear mode. And there's that's like a, that's a highlight. <laughs> paintings turn into eyeballs that are like swirling around. Yeah, and stuff it's like it's that. some weird stuff. But that's that was my cool. first time that I, that I witnessed his stuff. I haven't seen Pan's Labyrinth. It's a uh, yeah. You gotta watch it. Uh, so I I put um uh this film Shape of Water in what is a rather small collection of movies uh, in my mind castle, <laughs> mind palace, mind palace. <laughs> uh, we still good, namely, um, perfect movies. Oh yeah, I call this a perfect movie, and Pan's Labyrinth is next to it. Nice, it is one of those movies. Well, then I definitely have to see that. Um, yeah. For reference, I also put Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind 
and uh, Edward Scissorhands on that shelf. Nice. And boy, those movies all kind of feel very similar now that I think about it. <laughs> yeah. They're all kind of like this weird fantasy it almost, imaginative thing. Yeah. It's almost, it's like this kind of magic happens when a director is challenged to make a movie that is not of this world on a low budget. Yeah. It's like Cloverfield. Yeah. Yeah, and the and the Cloverfield sequel especially. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. it's oh, not yeah. of this world, but it's on a small budget, and so your ability to create fantasy, a fantastic spectacle and a fantastic <coughs> world, is not is based more on your creativity mm-hmm. and your storytelling ability mm-hmm. than it is your pocketbook. You know, it's funny. You could say that in that same idea that Star Wars Episode Eight could have used their filming techniques where they talked about the force connection between the two people. Um, they could have used that as their creativity to create like a low budget Star Wars film and just kind of <laughs> talk about the force in that kind of thematic or cinematic way yeah. that they were doing. Well, you know, I think that's I think this is the very reason why A New Hope is the best Star Wars movie. Yeah. Oh, it's right. Like it's right. because of the creative restraints. Right. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it's why The Matrix is a great movie. Yeah. And the sequels are not. I know you like <laughs> the sequels, and that's fine. You're allowed to like them, but I'm going to insist they're not great movies. They're, they're not. Yeah, they're not well-told stories. No. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. And it's because it's my they, episode three. <laughs> Wachowskis were practically given a blank check to make. You know. Right. It's like, well, if you can make us the Matrix again, go for it. Here's all the money you want, and they did some really cool things, but they did not have the creative drive and focus that they had on that first movie right. where they where they really had to prove something and they had budget limitations which is why since 8 the first episode is good and the rest of the series is terrible <laughs> I haven't watched Oh since 8 yeah <laughs> yeah I know it happens a lot it happens a lot I've, I've seen this with a lot of filmmakers and a lot of franchises you know where the, where the budget budgetary constraints is what flourishes creativity yes yeah yeah um, and so most of my favorite movies are in that like ten million dollar yeah level uh, budget split, split being one of them you know yeah stuff like yeah that. and that was that was now um, you know M Night Shyamalan had already proved himself in big ways in the past but now he was in a position where he had to reprove himself <laughs> right. yeah and he found himself in that position like he was a new filmmaker right yeah. and made this uh, twelve million I think it was was the budget on that I think it actually was like straight up ten million bucks yeah. Yeah, that's, that's really a cool. Great movie. Yeah, yeah it is. Talk about fan- fantasy within a tiny budget, right? That's a that's a pretty big fantasy. You know what I what I think is similar about all the four of those films you listed? Yeah, is the budget obviously, and then they all take place in a world that is not quite our world, but, but you still see these things that you recognize similar, on a day to day life. Yeah. But they're all just slightly different. Well, and again, that 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 goes to the budget thing as well. Yeah. You don't, you need to use the world that exists, <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly. And just slightly yeah. modify it. <laughs> yeah. It's just like I think about the like the way the neighborhood looks in Edward Scissorhands. Yeah, like, yeah. there's no neighborhood in the world that looks like that, right. but it, it fits in perfectly in the like world and atmosphere they created for that. Yeah, film. yeah, definitely. I love yeah. that kind of it's stuff. It's such a good movie too. Yeah, it is a good such movie. a good movie. I I definitely play Shape of Water up there with perfect films. Yeah, yeah, it's it's, it's quite, damn near perfect. Yeah, there's like. Nothing sticks out at me creatively that I didn't agree with. Well, then let's let's move into. Uh, I I want to get to the visuals, but before we do that, let's just take a little longer on the performances. Um, how hard must it have been to be a a performing a lead role who doesn't speak? Yeah. I want to talk about that real quick. Yeah. The so I I figured I think that's like a completely genius way to introduce or not introduce but just develop a character in a visual medium is to have them mute, yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean t- I mean we're talking about talkies, right? Our our medium allows for us to record voice and we have to st- tell a story through this medium. When you're telling a story through visuals, it's just really nice to have someone who can't actually speak. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's really cool. Uh, well, I, th- I, th- I think the ability to speak is a, a crutch. Yeah. yeah and sometimes a, a big hindrance because, oh, yeah. uh, man, how many great scenes are completely ruined because 
the writer decided that the best way to get information to the audience is to have someone just say it right. know, and like <laughs> turn to the person next to him and explain the thing the thing that happened a hundred years ago <laughs> that the person next to him obviously knew already all anime all of it <laughs> right yeah 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 i just saw the the new hbo series gunpowder which is really well done, but the script it, it has so much of that. Just saying, it was the like, stuff well, the happening. audience needs to know the backstory because this is a historical <laughs> thing, and so like we have all these characters explaining what everyone should already know. <laughs> this happened a hundred years ago, and it, right. it completely traumatized all of our village. Yes, it did. Yes, it did. <laughs> I feel the same as you. What the heck? It's like, you might as well turn to me in the audience and wink. <laughs> That's um, funny. And so take away the ability to speak. Now you're, now you're forced to use the visual media. Right. Yeah. And she used the sign language uh, sparingly. Yeah. You know? She really yeah. did. I yeah. honestly, I, I went in expecting to actually read quite a lot of subtitles. I thought nope. she was going to sign a lot. Not but it's much. only like a couple scenes. Like yeah. A few shots have subtitles. Yeah. So I was impressed by that. That was really impressive. Um, jumping back to Blade Runner, um, the theatrical cut has all that voiceover explaining all of the world right, and to they you and stuff like that. Take it out. Yeah, and then removing it makes it a whole different kind of experience where it becomes more of like a tone poem where it's like very atmospheric and you have to like infer what the world is like through what you're presented with rather than be explained all yeah. the nitty gritty details of the world. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, definitely. Uh, show don't tell. It's just yeah, it really, really presents itself well. It's a good movie. rule. Show don't tell. Yeah. yeah. Well, speaking of showing, then uh, let's talk about the art direction and cinematography. Ooh, this art direction was so cool. The art direction was <laughs> yeah. so good. The beginning montage uh, where it just shows her life. I just I fell in love with the movie right there. And with her. And with yeah. her. Like, yeah. I like mean, I had, my heart melted for her. I wanted her to be my neighbor so I could take care of her. It was like, so, like, I want to help you. It was so cool. It reminded me a lot of uh, what's, uh, I know you're not going to get this, Kenny, but Bioshock, the video game. Oh, yeah. I had Kenny a lot doesn't of. doesn't play video games. <laughs> <laughs> um, just that, uh, that underground secret 60s era stuff was yeah. just, it's so cool to look at. Uh, yeah, the time period was set very very well yeah it's, and yeah. then just real subtle things too and like the world building like I, I really enjoyed this had nothing to do with the plot but i just love that when she first comes into her neighbor's house the artist next door and she, he says what's that smell roasted cocoa and then five minutes later they don't expect she's not holding cocoa but five minutes later when she leaves her apartment you see fire trucks driving down the road to the chocolate factory oh. down the street which is in on fire oh. i didn't catch that yeah i didn't catch it either wow yeah. <laughs> that's great subtle world building right that's great yeah um and uh but boy the color palette is what has me over the moon about this i try to learn from movies and this was a lesson <laughs> to me which is i want to do this with every narrative maybe even documentary if you can pull it off i think the thing i make yeah. is is i want to consciously choose a, a color palette yeah and use it. This movie, like, if you took out all the shades of blue-green, you know, tealish color, if you take out all the teal, mm -hmm. all the bronze, and all the orange, you would be left with a nearly black and white movie. Like, <laughs> there was not very much color <laughs> right. beyond those shades. Sorry, did I move your camera? I don't think so. Yeah, yeah. This, I still look wonderful. Good. <laughs> um... Yeah. And it was so fun. It like, was. It it I don't I'm I don't really have a working theory for why that's so pleasing mm. to to my eyes, mm -hmm. but I sure loved it. Do you do you know the color theory behind that? I mean, there's there's always the classic blue orange theory of blockbuster yeah. movies where color contrast. Yeah, exactly. Where yeah, humans but this wasn't made this is not a blockbuster. Well, so so this is what's really cool about it though is that the the um so the reason why blockbuster movies all grad uh, gradually became um, blue orange was because the the blue undertones of the cool uh, shadows and everything uh, gave movies a, a cold presence and then it naturally contrasts with the uh, human skin 
which mm. is which is orangish. Oh, interesting. Uh, so not only does it make people pop out of the background more, but it makes them feel more lively against a colder background. So when you have uh, what you were talking about earlier about uh, ca- character contrast, I think you were talking about this earlier with me and Taylor about something else. But um, but the the sea monster in here is is the cool blue, cold, unrelenting like submersion water everything yeah. <laughs> uh, feel about him. And <clears throat> she's a very and the underneath yeah. and, and yeah. she's a very bright, very yes. uh, animated um, feel feeling person, very yes. warm. Uh, and uh, same with their apartment. Um, that was really cool. How super golden and super bronze mm-hmm. everything was. Mm-hmm. Um, and in contrast with the blue, it just mixed really, really well together. So there's your when basic color When the thing. color disappeared, because we went to a black and white sequence for her dance number, it was such a, a uh, shocking feeling. Yeah. Like yeah. water was thrown in your face. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean... Yeah. Uh, uh, because the, the the I think your eyes adjust to a color palette as well. Yeah, and you get used to seeing those tones alone. And I find that then when they introduce a another color that hasn't been on the screen very much, like right. a blood splatter, right, that red just pops big time. Mm. Right, it's yeah. very cool. It's, it's a really cool effect. It's like the almost like the uh, thing in Schindler's List with the red balloon. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that is like that. Or like an it with the red balloon. <laughs> <laughs> no, not really. No, not quite. Okay. Not quite. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think there was a little bit of a thematic um, stuff with the choice, specifically with the choices of blue and green being like the dominant colors and like they shades definitely are. within. Um, especially where the, t- the specifically the guy's, the antagonist's car is, he gets oh. this like... Blue. He I forgot about that. Yeah. yeah. He yeah. Gets this... and, and he even has a conversation yeah. with them about what is the color. Yeah. <laughs> right. And, you know, he's so... like, I'll take this green one. And he's like, actually, it's teal. <laughs> yeah. And, and so he, he gets this this confusion with this teal, which is a more blue-ish color. Yeah. And with green. And that kind of confusion um, kind of... Uh, to me, that that speaks towards. He's always popping green <clears throat> candies. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, wow. that's another thing. It kind of speaks towards um, the difference between like the the, the Aquaman himself. Yeah, how he's like half humanoid, half oh interesting alien. You so, think that's like a thematic? Yeah, I think parallel. it's a thematic thing where that's it's cool. the confusion of colors and the confusion with the humanity of this alien creature, kind of a thing. That's that's a neat observation. That's really cool. Yeah. Noise. Uh, I was a big fan of the music. That we, accordion. I love yeah, that Yeah, we had the, sort of an ongoing accordion. Felt very much like you were at a French cafe. Yeah, <laughs> yeah very And much. All, all I can say is that, that there, there was much of this film that felt like uh, homages to French cinema. Yeah. And so I, I felt that kind that music coming through when whenever when when eliza isn't speaking i expect that if she could it would have a french accent yeah like she just <laughs> looks too. like she should you know she does yeah um so that music fit it fit nicely i don't even know why it fits so nicely true to form for guillermo guillermo del toro he used a uh practical effect completely practical effect for the creature I'm not sure about the eyes. Yeah. I feel like the eyes might have been digitally <laughs> yeah. enhanced. Some of the face looked digital. But it was a person in a suit. Yeah. It was a person in a suit. Some some of that didn't come off too well to me. It, it Some of it looked like a rubber suit, and I was just like, eh. Especially in the, the dance scene. Like, yes, I, but I, 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 I think that was different. Ripples. I felt like they didn't care. Oh, I see. Yeah. You can tell in the yeah. dance scene. In the dance scene, I, I would say it. Because he said he actually <laughs> threw out uh, some shots that he was very partial to. Because uh, the performance was too human. Mm. Yeah, see um, now that I could see. So, and I guess in the in the dance scene it was okay because that is extremely human moment. Yes. Right. Yeah. Right. It's yeah. a purely fantastical sequence. So. Interesting. Yeah, there were some moments like when he got it, like out of the tub or something. Just the movement of his of his arms or the movement of his feet when he walked, something like that. Just a tiny bits, and I'm just like, oh, that, human, <laughs> that, human. <laughs> <laughs> His uh, uh, the creature design was phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. really, really cool. Yeah, it was cool. 
I like the idea that it had uh, dual breathing systems. Yeah, you know, that's cool. That was interesting. It could breathe air or, you know, gills or lungs kind of right, thing. Right, right. That was really cool. And his healing abilities. That's why yeah, that was a really like interesting I wonder if those little blue lights were part of his suit or if those were added, added. digitally. Hmm. Maybe a bit know. of both. I could see it being part of a suit. I see yeah. it could too, yeah. which is really cool. Um, uh, you know, I thought he was doing when he touches uh, the neighbor's hair or like the head, uh-huh. which is later revealed that he, he grows, grows his hair. hair back. Yeah. My first thought was he was like expanding his consciousness Dude, or something. Yeah. That's exactly where my mind went. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know why. Yeah. So <laughs> like we're going to share minds now. Yeah. Like they, they mind meld. Yeah. yeah. So that that would have been funny. cool. But yeah, I like, no, he saw the bald head as like an injury. Yeah. I guess yeah. So, I can yeah. fix that. <laughs> that's, that's so funny. Yeah. That was really cool. I really like that. Yeah. Um, were there many other uh, effects to speak of or any thoughts on the editing? Not really on the editing. I mean, the editing seemed to be quite straightforward and good. Yeah. I mean, typically a, 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 a good movie has invisible editing. Right. right. A this great would be, yeah. movie has editing that editors notice. <laughs> <laughs> right. And that's you know that's it. Yeah. yeah. No, I, there was nothing that popped out to me. Yeah. Other than like just... you can notice bad editing. Right. It's really hard to notice good editing. Right. Right. Yeah. Another thought I had on the music was yes. one. There's that accordion, mm-hmm. and then later on in the movie they introduce this theme with like a a really it's like a synthesizer kind of sound, and it's like not a theremin, but it seems very period sounding, like sci-fi, like B movie kind of sound like a 60s movie? yeah like a 60s b movie <laughs> kind of sound and I, I liked how that fit in with like the alienness of uh the uh aquaman and then the accordion makes it very french and it's such a weird combination of sounds that totally works yeah um and then also to jump randomly to the movie theater underneath the apartment yes i just love that it I is love like that, too. that that was really like cool that. i love so that cool. i like the part where she floods the <laughs> yeah. entire bathroom yeah. it's just like completely impossible and Again, I love, yeah also impossible yeah. but i love like, it though okay, yeah yeah it doesn't yeah. matter it didn't bother it, me it, one bit no. it fit and then yeah the i loved it so they could float together yeah. in the water like that yeah i love that the water's dripping down in the theater <laughs> <laughs> he starts coughing. Yeah. Ew, fish sex water. Fish sex water. <laughs> Dripping on me. Um, I like the way that? that she manages to sign uh, that that the creature has a penis. Because <laughs> 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 her friend her friend is all like, you, you did what? With but the, does he have a... How? <laughs> and she has like this... <laughs> <laughs> this way of signing that he has a he has a penis and, like a retractable penis. Yes, it's so and funny. Like, she's all, damn girl. <laughs> <laughs> that was quite good. Yeah, it was very quite funny. Um, let's see. How about th- you have a you have a thought bubble? An, an, I do have a thought bubble. Yes. Um, I just wanted to talk about real quick. There was uh, I just really appreciate tiny details like this. But so there's a tiny motivating factor. For to show us the cameras that were in the that were in the place, because um, oh, yeah. the whole last uh, sequence that that goes into the ending depends solely on them looking at the cameras, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Um, to figure out where she is and how she blocks it and everything, um, and how they even bring it up in the first place isn't just there's a camera there. In most other movies, they would. <laughs> in this one, they talk about it because they're smoking, right? And yeah. And they shouldn't be smoking. And he's like, don't worry about it. There's a blind spot. And that's when the, we see the cameras. And I'm just like, I, I love yeah. that. Yeah. There's a little appreciation there. Yeah. Yeah, that is good. Oh, one thing I'm realizing now that I just think back about it. The, the other thing it, it did really well uh, is making you care about virtually every character. Oh, yeah. So in many movies, <coughs> um, I find when we cut away to a sort of subplot, you know, or, or like a... a what do you call the the what do you call narratives that run parallel? B movie parallel narratives. <laughs> you know, when you cut across to the other narrative, yeah, uh, some it doesn't the B story. hold you. Like you're like, I don't care about this character. I'd like to get back. Yeah, right. you know, that was my big problem with the Last Jedi. Yeah, we right. kept going over to Finn and Rose. <laughs> right. you just and like, I'm yeah. like, just just go back to Luke and Ray or <laughs> right. something. And uh, 
With this one, uh, the Russian operative double agent guy, I loved his storyline and I felt fear for him and I really wanted him to escape and survive. For the uh, the the villain, you know, agent, whatever his name is, um, he uh, was super interesting. Yeah, and you see him go home and kiss his kids and hug his wife, you know, and, and his 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 wife's like, you know, like like is just like in love with her hardworking husband and mm-hmm. wants to please him in a very nineteen fifties <laughs> right. I I live to please my man kind of way. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. and. Uh, and I, I I ate it all up. Yeah, you know I ate it all up. I, I never I never was disappointed to be any place. Yeah. in this movie, I loved it. And it, it, it didn't. It didn't. That's f- an accomplishment. Yes, <laughs> it didn't feel like it was cutting away from the film. Like where, like the last Jedi felt like um, when it was like <laughs> cutting back and forth. It was like it was like you're leaving the movie every time you cut to a different plot. Yeah. yeah. Whereas every time you're cutting to a different plot in this in Shape of Water, it feels more like. Uh, it's all servicing one whole right rather than like oh good more of that other the yeah. more of the big plot yeah rather than it, like being totally separate or and non related the characters all um, kind of know each other and are all connected it's, whereas you know Finn is not really connected to Ray at all well so or, that's what's know. funny right is that in in uh, Star Wars episode eight, they. I like how we're comparing Star Wars. Yeah, to we're already back to Star but, Wars. But but in there where they have four like separate parallel stories, they're all completely interconnected, like very literally connected. Yeah. Like there's even they have trackers <laughs> that are supposed to like uh, communicate with each other or something. But um, yeah, but when they cut in between them, it's like you don't care what's going on because you want to get back to one part that they're explaining, mm-hmm. and they don't they haven't explained how these other ones have fully you know emotionally invested within each other when these other ones are all based on the characters and the characters are emotionally invested in each other yeah so you understand and you get it and yeah want to know more yeah well uh it's about that time why don't we wrap up with our just a concluding thought on the shape of water taylor definitely 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 one of the best movies of the year go see it um one of the best movies I've seen in a, in quite a while, in the past few years even, and it really is just a very creative, imaginative film that feels like, like it's it feels like a movie that had to have been done in film, the medium of film, and it <laughs> feels best served there. And so I like movies that are like uh, movies. <laughs> Good point. Good point. <laughs> yes. Good point. Um, I would say that uh, there's only a few times we talked about this before where I've been transported into another movie world, right? Avatar took me there. Uh, what do you call it? Uh, Blade Runner. The Matrix, Blade Runner, and... Um, anyway, other movies. But this one. This yeah. one took me there, too. And I just I love that, just being immersed into a world and really just competent storytelling. And I like it when the director actually respects his own story. Yeah. You know? Doesn't have to subvert. We're not going on that. <laughs> line again but yeah <laughs> so last, Jedi. last Jedi yeah <laughs> and as for me it was just so refreshing to enjoy a movie at the cinema <laughs> you know and, and what I thoroughly enjoy about it is that I I, I didn't see things coming yeah. I, I, I did not know what to anticipate but it wasn't in a forced way it was yeah. in a way that made sense and was beautiful and um, made me feel things you know <laughs> Uh, so yes, this this is without a doubt my favorite movie of the year mm, of, of yeah. 2017, um, which uh, and I and I hope it wins racks up some awards because uh, I I want to see more storytelling like this. Definitely, yeah. All right, me too. Okay, guys. Well, thank you for indulging us, uh, listeners, <laughs> listening to us again for another hour or something as we talk about a movie this time that we like. Good, yeah, we got a good movie in. You've been watching or listening to The Talkies. Uh, please check out our other podcasts if you haven't already, WTFM Night Shyamalan and Confirmed, and take some time to explore our YouTube channel. We do a lot of uh, interesting things. Lots of stuff. Yeah. And lots of stuff coming up. Yep. More to come. Stay in touch, guys. And until next time, I'm Kenny. I'm Taylor. And I'm D. And we'll see you at the Tuckies. Go! Our cans, none of them hit each other. No. <laughs> That's okay. We said boom. Yeah, it's the sound effect. Right, mine's full. Oh, forget it. <laughs> you. <laughs>
Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Splash all over the camera. You are to be in pictures. You're wonderful to see. You are to be in pictures. Oh, what a hit you would be. Your voice would thrill.